Good evening. Thank you all for your patience. Um, my, welcome to the 2019 Peter Carmel Forum in Public Policy, hosted by the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. My name is Liz West. I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Academy. Um, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Welcome to our speakers, guests, and Academy Fellows. As an autonomous non-government organization, the Academy's mission is to promote the importance of knowledge and the social sciences, celebrate research excellence, and advocate solutions to social challenges. We do this through a range of programs, including the public forums. And this program aims to raise awareness of the social sciences within the community, among policymakers, and to encourage debate. This particular forum honors uh, the late Professor Peter Carmel, who had a profound impact on higher education and public policy in Australia over many decades. He was also president of the Academy from 1987 to 1990. This series is intended to um, discuss the political process itself or compare policies from different regions and think about, differently think about the way that we t undertake policy. Tonight I'll be joined by three eminent scholars. Each will provide a 10 minute perspective on elements of the values policy nexus. Julie Lee is professor of marketing and the founding director of the Center for Human and Cultural Values at the University of Western Australia. Her research focuses on theories and measurement of human and cultural values and the way they are expressed individually and in society. Linda Bottrell is Professor of Australian Politics and Head of the School of Government and Policy at the University of Canberra. Prior to her academic career, she spent 15 years in public policy practice as an officer in the APS, an advisor to two ministers in the Keating government, and a senior policy officer in two industry associations. Brian Head is Professor of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Queensland, and he's previously worked in government and the NGO sector. His government work included pro public sector reform and intergovernmental agreements, and his current research interests include the quality and integrity of decision making, evidence-based policy, program evaluation, wicked problems, collaboration, and building trust. Could you please join me in welcoming our speakers? Thank you, and thank you to those who um, humoured me in the small poll. Actually, I'm going to talk today um, as the first speaker about human values, and my role really is to put us all on the same page of the book, to make sure that we have a common understanding of values as we move forward through the other presenters. So when I talk to people about values, they often think about virtues. Values can be virtues, but they don't have to be. Values are desirable, motivational goals. Desirable is not the same as moral, although some desirable goals are moral goals. Um, this is one of the many ways in which we elicit values from individuals. The first one is probably what we might think is a virtue or a moral value. Many of the others aren't. I can see we have some academics in the audience because being free to act independently is often a value that's important to academics. Um, being ambitious and successful is often a value important to younger people. I'm going to talk about what values are as broad motivational goals and then link them to um, our attitudes and behaviours. So um, values reflect what is most important in our lives. The thing is that we all have different things that are important to us in life. So we don't all hold the same values as important. What we do, though, know is that there's a relatively limited set of values, they don't go on forever, that are universally found to be important to people across societies. I'm going to talk to you about one of the theories that's very well supported that will help us understand what values are, but also the compatibilities and conflicts between values. So this is um, a flower, but it's also a circle. And what it represents is the relationship between this set of 10 universal values that Professor Shalom Swartz theorised and came up with what the relations are based on the underlying motivations between them. So in this circle, 
um, things that are next to each other share common motivations, and things that are opposing in the circle have conflicting motivations. So I'm going to talk about some of these. It helps us to understand why people might have conflicts and understand why it might be difficult to um, understand somebody that has values that are very different from your own values. So if we have a look at the self-transcendence values, they're at the bottom in blue. Um, universalism, that's caring about the weak and vulnerable in society, caring about nature, and caring about the welfare of your family and friends. Those are commonly called self-transcendence values. They're called that because um, if you're motivated by those values, you're motivated to put other people ahead of yourself. If you look at the opposite values, self-enhancement, we have power and achievement. Those values um, motivate you to put yourself ahead of others. You need to be better than others in order to achieve and to have wealth and social power. You can't do both at the same time. So if you are motivated to put others ahead of yourself to look after the welfare of other people, you're less likely to be motivated by power and achievement and vice versa. Although saying that, all values are desirable or at least somewhat desirable. So it's not that some are unimportant to you, it depends on which are most important because it's the most important values that guide our attitudes and behaviours. The other trade-off that I'll talk about is the difference between being open to change and conservation or more conservative. So um, people who are open to change, um, stimulation can be a guiding principle for, the, for those people, excitement, variety in life or self-direction. And opposing to that is the preservation of the status quo, um, conformity, tradition and security. So if uh, security is really important to you, then you're less likely to find it really important to have novelty and stimulation and change in life. And these values have been linked to political attitudes. Linda's probably going to talk a little bit about that. They've been linked to a lot of different attitudes, um, including um, attitudes towards the environment and behaviours, like recycling behaviours. Um, and they're also interesting to have a look at because it's quite difficult to understand people who have different values to you. So, for instance, if your values are um, very self-directed, um, if um, freedom of thought and action is really important to you, you'll find it difficult to understand somebody for whom security is the most important value. And we did a lot of studies where we took people into focus groups with similar values. One of our studies, we took people to zoos to look at exhibits. And what we found is that people with different value priorities um, look at things in very different ways and they want different information. We asked them how, um, how they would like us to change an exhibit at a zoo that was there to um, elicit more environmental behaviour from them. One of the important things that zoos need to do is to uh, promote environmental behaviour. And so we took people in value-based groups into these exhibits and they spoke about the exhibits and what would motivate them in very different ways. So those who are open to change, they wanted to interact with the animals. They wanted the animals to entertain them and they were really um, annoyed when they saw a bored animal. They wanted to give it a rubric cube something that they could play with, um, even though animals that are very comfortable are often quiet and not exciting. People who had high on the conservation values, they said, um, for us to act environmentally, we need to know how bad it is. Sort of an avoidance. You, we need you to tell us you know, that it's really, really important and all the bad things that are going to happen to motivate us. The, the openness to change people wanted nothing to hear nothing about how bad it was. They really wanted to hear about what they could do that was positive and approach 
People who were self-enhancement, we had a lot of trouble getting them to the zoos. <laughs> but the people that we did get to the zoos were, um, they, they wanted us to really do a cost-benefit analysis on environmental <laughs> behaviour and tell us what, what they would, how they would benefit from acting in a more environmentally conscious manner. And the people who were uh, self-transcendents really just wanted to cuddle the animals and um, they were really happy with almost any of the exhibits that were there. They were, the exhibits were mostly speaking to the converted people who already knew what they wanted. So what I'm talking about is two things. One is the content of values, the things that are really important as guiding principles in life. These things may not necessarily be conscious to you, but they're activated when you're in a situation that brings them into conflict. For instance, if you were offered a job that gave you really high pay and great opportunities for advancement, and you had an alternative offer that ha you, had, you could work less and you would have more time for your family. In this situation, the values should be the way in which you choose between those choices. So um, values are situationally relevant, but there are also some values that we think of as uh, chronically accessible. So your very most important value is just under the surface all of the time. Um, one of my most, the most important value for me is self-direction. So if somebody tells me what to do, I actually have a physical reaction to that. My skin feels like I get goosebumps and I feel a reaction to it. If you have a deeply held value, when somebody challenges it, you feel that sort of reaction to it and it's really hard to overcome. So we've got a content of values that I'm talking about and then there's ways in which to communicate with people. So in our study of zoos, we were looking at trying to encourage people to act in more environmentally conscious ways. What we found and what we were testing is whether or not we could motivate them to the same behaviour using appeals that related to their value systems. And so you can have, a, people can have different values but behave in the same way for different reasons. And it's one of the reasons why it's really difficult to know what someone else's values are without asking them. So I want to show you um, some information about Australians' values. We asked 7,500 Australians what their values were um, in a slightly different but almost similar version to that first question that I put up. And um, this is the uh, value priorities of most Australians. So most Australians ascribe the most importance to benevolence, caring for the welfare of family and friends, um, and security almost as much. Um, Univer societal universalism is caring for the welfare of other people, all other people. And these are the three most important values on average to, uh, to our Australian sample. I qualify that because our sample was set up to have equal age groups. So we have more older people in our sample than we would in a, reflect, in a, in a representative sample. Um, what's really interesting here is we also ask people about the values of most Australians. And you can see that they're almost identical in terms of the average of the people in our sample and the average of their perceptions of most Australians. Um, but it takes on a slightly different form if we look at what the most important value was to people. And before I go into that, I just want to uh, show you how much variability there is within this information. You probably can't see too much of this slide, but let me just tell you what those blue squares represent. We divided people into groups based on their most important value. And then we looked at their perceptions of most Australians' values. And um, so the blue is their own value and how important they perceive that to be for most other Australians. And you can see here that in almost all of the cases, people perceive most Australians to value very similar values to their own. 
And that's because we naturally think everyone should think what we think is important is important. Values are deeply held, held beliefs. And so if you really believe them, you think other people should also buy into the same values. There's a couple that didn't quite work out. One was power, that's the one with the really low blue. And you can imagine why that might be the case because people who highly value power probably see that other people don't highly value this as well. So they have that reinforced. And the other low one is conformity. And I think that people who value conformity probably see that other people aren't always conforming to ex expectations. So other than that, we really do project our values on other people. That shows why the average of, say, a society's values is maybe not the best way to look at things. So we also had a look at what the most important value was and how prevalent that was in our sample. Um, Benevolence had the highest prevalence in the sample. Almost 38% of people said caring for the welfare of their family and friends was the most important guiding principle or value to them. This differed quite a lot, not so much by male and female, but it differed by how old you were. With young people, only about 25% of them saying benevolence was the most important, and older people and those with kids almost 50% of them said this was the most important. If we look at young people, the values that younger people placed a high importance on, almost three times as much as older people were hedonism, stimulation and achievement. And people who don't have children in the example, so they placed the higher um, about twice as much import, uh, twice as much prevalence of universalism nature, so wanting to protect the environment, self-direction and achievement. Probably none of this is terribly surprising when you think about it, but it is interesting to see how much variability there is between people in the values that they hold as most important to them. Also interesting to look at power. Only 1% of our sample said power was the most important. What's interesting about this is everywhere that we do this survey, so the value system that I showed you has been found in hundreds of samples in more than 80 countries. And in every case, we find at least some people who value each of the specific values. So in our sample, it was 1% and they were all males. So just putting up this system of values again, um, so that we can understand that values um, are not all virtues. They're desirable goals, and we differ in what we hold as important to us. That we think our own values are the most important, and therefore naturally think that other people should also value that and that it's really hard, quite hard, to communicate with people that hold different values to you. And it's hard to understand why they do what they do. And having this system helps us to understand the variety of values that might be driving people. And once you understand this, you can understand that you can actually communicate with people with different values by understanding the underlying motivations, what motivates them in terms of the important things in their life. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. So what I want to talk about now is, well, what does this actually mean for policy and politics? And I'm sure, thanks to Julie's presentation, you're beginning to see a little bit of what this is about. But where Alan and I were coming from in the book, which is part of the motivation for tonight's presentation, was the idea that a lot of the way we think about policy and politics is probably mistaken. Um, we think, and we've been discussing this for a long time, that what if we started thinking about policy and politics in terms of the community as being a community of people who contain these, who have these different values priorities. So particularly in a democracy, how does the government of the day make decisions on behalf of the collective when all of the members of that collective prioritise these 10 universal human values in different ways. 
It's hard enough for us in just one-on-one -on -one situations to negotiate with people when we have to make collective decisions in groups. But what's it like when you're a policymaker that has to make choices on behalf of the whole community? You're going to be faced with making choices that bring some of these into conflict. An example that immediately springs to mind is how does a community respond to the problem of an influx of people fleeing difficult situations of refugees? Well, obviously, if you look at this circle, people who strongly hold universalism and benevolence values are going to favour being as sympathetic and as supportive to people who are fleeing from desperate situations. But for people whose lives are guided more strongly by security values, they're going to be concerned that perhaps these people that we're letting into the country are going to do us or our families harm. Now, policymakers have to make a choice. They are in a position to make a decision about what the community's response is going to be to an influx of refugees, knowing that these different values are out there in the community. And they then have to think about how they're going to juggle these values. So I would like to have start people thinking about the policy process as a process of juggling con conflicting societal values. A lot of the literature that talks about values talks about balancing values, but we don't like that metaphor very much because balance suggests that you get to a point of equilibrium and it's kind of fixed and comfortable. Juggling allows you to remember that you're keeping all sorts of different objects of different shapes and different weights in motion, dropping some at some time and picking them up at others. So what we would like to suggest is that it's worth thinking about the political system as being about values, that the political system is about a community expressing its values through the democratic process, and that the policy-making process is part of that political process. So we, again in the book, and I've been arguing this for a long time, argue very strongly that public policy needs to remember that it's the business end of politics. We get a lot of talk amongst, amongst public servants and amongst commentators that if only we could take the politics out of this policy question, we'd get good policy. Our argument is that you're never going to do that because policy is what we elect our politicians to do. We elect them to make choices on our behalf when they're faced with problems in the community and those choices are almost always going to involve balancing conflicting societal values. Now we argue that the work that Shalom Schwartz and Julie's team and so on have done provides a really invaluable approach that political scientists and public policy scholars and, I would argue, public policy practitioners could pick up to help them understand what they're dealing with. I have a dream that one day this circle or something like it will be on the wall in public service offices so that when a policy question comes forward, public servants can go, well, what values are likely to be activated by this? Which interest groups are likely to represent which values? Who do we need to talk to? Are the values that are activated by this policy problem contiguous or opposite each other on this circle? If they're comfortably next to each other, this is probably going to be a fairly easy policy problem for us to handle. But if it activates issues that are on either side of that circle, perhaps we are going to have policy conflict and policy dispute. And I'd like to reflect back on last week's election. A lot of people, I've been watching the reaction on Twitter, which has been interesting, and a lot of the, the judgment has been as if people have been extremely anti the environment and want to dig it all up, or absolutely pure on climate change. Now, my argument to many people who've raised this with me is, for many people, many, many people, issues around climate change matter. Many people have a certain degree of those universalism values. But for some people, they don't rank as highly as some of the other values that cause them to vote in other directions. So although we tend to present policy debates as very, very polarised, so the refugee debate is about the cold-hearted bastards who would shoot the refugees at the border against the bleeding-heart liberals who'd let anybody into the country, actually most of us are somewhere kind of in the middle. There's a mushy, sloppy middle in there where we all have similar values, but we prioritise them differently. And it's because we prioritise them differently that we disagree on the way society should function. So our vision of the good society differs 
from one individual to the next because we hold the different sorts of values and different sorts of priorities that Julie was talking about. So I guess in a nutshell, and I'll probably wrap it up there because I think Julie did such a great job of explaining to you what the values were about and we can talk about this more when we get to the discussion. I think it's really critical that we started thinking about both policy and politics in values terms. Yes, things like power and influence are important, but I think much of that actually derives from our differences that come from values. So I would argue that ideologies that political parties present to us are systematizations of values, they're packages of values. A political party is saying to the community that this political party prioritises these values over those values. So the Labour Party prioritises collective values, perhaps more of, this, of the, the um, benevolence in universalism values, whereas you look at the National Party, for example, it's much more tradition and conformity values. That doesn't mean they don't care about the others, but in their, their system, they prioritise them. So if we start thinking about policy debate in those terms, I think we can start doing, as Julie suggests, framing political debate to appeal to the values of our audience. I would like to just very quickly refer to the debate around the Murray-Darling Basin. A number of years ago, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority released the first version of the, of the plan for the Murray-Darling Basin. And many of you may remember that copies of the plan were burnt in the streets of Griffith. Australia doesn't often make bonfires out of policy documents, but we did on this occasion. And there were a lot of very, very angry farmers. And if you think about that in value terms, it was because the legislation and the process prioritised the environment above everything else. So when the Murray-Darling Basin Authority went into the basin to talk about the Murray-Darling plan and why we needed it, they basically said to the farming communities, the Murray-Darling Basin is a mess, we've got to take your water away because you're using too much and it's destroying the environment. Obviously, they didn't get a great reaction. However, if they had gone into the basin understanding the values of the farmers, who are very traditional, who are attached to their land, who want to pass their farms on to their children, and they had said, we've got a collective problem. There's not enough water in the Murray-Darling Basin for you to be able to continue to operate the way you are and to pass your farms on to your families. If they had started with the common values that they shared with the farming community, who, let's face it, who's at whose cooperation and action they needed to implement their plan, they wouldn't have ended up having the head of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority leave his job and have to go back to the drawing board and rewrite the program. So understanding that different values are out there is important in political rhetoric, it's important in, in framing political debate so that we can talk to each other in a way that is persuasive and respectful, acknowledging that there are different values in the community. I'll leave it there and hand over to Brian Head. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> th th thanks for the opportunity to be involved in this uh, really interesting discussion. Um, I've read the book twice. Uh, I've read it in Brisbane, and I thought I understood it. And then I thought I'd better read it again in Canberra, and I'm, not, I'm, still, sh I'm still sure I understand it. But uh, uh, I want to uh, take a slightly different tack. I want to talk about what I think the book is about, uh, without uh, undermining what John Dreisach's going to say later on, uh, and also a little bit of history about how uh, thinking about policy studies fits into this picture. So I'm old enough to remember the 1970s, and if we were thinking about how do we think about the policy system, uh, if you go back to the 70s, it was still quite popular to talk about political economy and to talk about politics as power and the struggle for power and for material interests being pitted against each other, uh, quite a bit of um, a neo-Marxist class struggle kind of thing that I remember um, pretty, pretty closely from, from that period. It was all about contestation. Uh, it was about the way in which, uh, in effect, the class struggle had been pacified and civilised by the growth of electoral politics, the growth of the welfare state, and uh, one of the most interesting uh, issues from the 70s through to the 80s uh, was how politics was seen as providing opportunities for redistribution. Um, 
And uh, uh, how do you do the trade-offs between capital and the working class and other economic interests? So a very strong material focus in a lot of that discussion of how the system worked in the 70s and 80s. And one of the things that people found really interesting about the Hawke, Keating and Kelty period uh, from the Accord 1985 onwards really was trying to put um, a new accommodation on an even keel for the long term, the, the way the trade-offs were done, uh, the way um, uh, coordination was achieved, uh, the concept of the social wage that's been talked about quite a lot actually in the last month. And uh, uh, I remember Greg Combe being uh, interviewed a few days ago and saying what the Labor Party forgot recently was that uh, there's no point talking first about redistribution. You've got to assure people that the cake will continue to be baked and there's something there to actually redistribute. Um, so getting that, that rhetoric right uh, has been a, a big learning from, from that period. And it's also a theme in the book that, that the way we sell ideas uh, is absolutely essential. It's not just about rhetoric and, and clever leaders, but it's also about, as the other speakers have said, the values, the way in which we evoke uh, values that are going to be important for the mainstream as well as for sexual interests. So uh, an economic understanding of policy, the hip, not, hip pocket nerve, all that kind of rhetoric from that early period uh, then became complemented by other perspectives um, uh, from the 70s, 80s onwards. Part of it is picked up in the book and also in Julie's talk about um, uh, things like post-materialist values. Uh, the way in which uh, the economic agenda was uh, complemented and amplified uh, by things like environmental protection, things like human rights, things like gender equality, things like respect for diversity, multicultural society, issues about immigration and all the rest of it. And Linda and Allen's book argues that um, economic interests as well as the, these post-materialist concerns are in fact all about values, that, that even when we look at economic things, we're actually talking about values. We're not talking about money uh, or just power. We're talking about a whole bunch of things that are picked up in the, uh, in the petals on that diagram. And the, the way in which we think about values as being the, uh, what, I, what I would like to call the sea in which we swim in politics and policy, it applies as much to the ruling class as to the workers. It applies as much to the intellectuals and the spin doctors as it does to uh, uh, working class Tories or people in blue collar jobs who voted for Trump uh, two or three years ago. Um, the term values becomes in this way of thinking a kind of a shorthand for how human beings make sense of the world and how they set priorities and, and not just uh, material, uh, but also their sense of identity, their sense of location, their sense of selfhood, uh, their sense of locality, as well as um, issues on that diagram, things like respect for tradition or authority, their tolerance of hierarchy or the desire for hierarchy, their, uh, their attitudes to diversity and inequality and so forth. Um, importantly, this is not uh, random, it's not totally individualised, it gets clustered, it gets patterned, and a lot of the most interesting work on values is therefore about the way these clusters and patterns work, and then the way they interact with uh, the political system and um, public policy. So social sciences, uh, together with market research um, outside the social sciences, has put a lot of effort into identifying and mapping attitudes and preferences. We do this for all kinds of reasons, some of it scholarly, uh, some of it to do with um, selling products and services to people, uh, market segmentation. If you read the literature on consumer behaviour uh, and advertising, it's absolutely full of it. Uh, some of it is social purpose stuff, the so-called social marketing. Some of it is just crass commercial stuff. Uh, but um, uh, everyone is onto this. Um, in a way that was not the case maybe 40 or 50 years ago. It provides, this, lit, this material provides leaders 
with uh, cues about how to be more persuasive, how to use rhetoric and language in ways that play to the audience and pick up on these evocative uh, key values that will um, garner support of one kind or another. So there's much to agree with in, uh, in the book about the fundamental nature of values. Uh, and uh, there's much to agree with in the book, which I won't, won't be talking about the middle chapters, but there's a wonderful demolition job in the middle chapters on what some of the mainstream uh, public policy theorising has had to say about the way the policy process works. That's not our topic for tonight, but if anyone has a remote interest in uh, the scholarship on how public policy theorising and the frameworks have developed, especially in the US, uh, there's, um, there's some good stuff in there. Um, so the, the case has been made uh, in the book that politics is mainly about value disputes. The case is made in the book that politics, as I said before, is the sea in which public policy is debated and shaped and reformed and refined and contested. Um, this then leads uh, Linda and Alan to um, a different argument, which is a strong attack on uh, scientism. Uh, it's, it's an argument about some of the themes in some of the scholarship around public policy, in particular the attempt to, uh, to create uh, generalisations and um, uh, clear and tight explanations for how, uh, how we think, how we make decisions, how we organise ourselves, how we do policy. Uh, the, the proposition is that, um, uh, that they're attacking is that um, science, a scientific study about politics and policy is both de possible and desirable. Possible because of the methodological innovations of the last 50 years in terms of doing surveys and regression analysis and structural equation modelling and all the rest of it, or at the micro end, um, uh, nudge trials, randomised control trials, various kinds of techniques for introducing scientific propositions into public policy debate. Um, science on this reading is, it offers technocratic uh, opportunities to obtain definitive answers to tough social issues. And Linda and Alan have quite a bit of fun attacking this set of propositions. Uh, if, if, we, if we were not talking about values, I'd have a bit of a, an argument with them about the way they phrase some of this. But um, I think there's some good middle ground. And in fact, I found a couple of paragraphs where they, they actually have a different, a more sympathetic position, a bit more like mine. So, um, uh, you know, the correct position. So, <laughs> is that what we cited you Yeah. So uh, the, the critique is based on, on the view that value differences are inherent. There can be no technical solutions or no correct technical solutions and, and that politics is about brokering accommodation. Um, so it's about conflict resolution. And that's, that's the basic underlying message of, of the book, I think. Uh, it's a bit more subtle than that, but I think that's really what it is. So uh, what that would lead to from one point of view would be uh, saying a lot more about how conflict resolution actually works. But um, there's a lot of political science about uh, institutions, and I think that's probably their answer, that you have parties which mobilise groups of people around particular issues and enduring problems, and you have democracy. And then more recently, you have things like um, uh, doodle polls and uh, uh, citizens' juries and various kinds of deliberative experiments to see how um, uh, different points of view could be accommodated. Uh, the, the modern problem in the last few years has been, I think, intensified by debates about how do we build trust and legitimacy around uh, finding methods to resolve issues. Uh, as they say many times, it's all about finding provisional answers. It's not about truth. It's not about definitive or verifiable solutions. It's about accommodations of some kind. Um, and in the modern era with, with populist leaders making fun of experts and deliberately claiming to speak in the name of 
uh, the people, whatever that means. I'm not sure what that means on the chart. Uh, we have in the Academy of Social Sciences and more broadly in, uh, you know, as it were, informed opinion circles uh, to deal with this issue of trust and legitimacy. And I think that's, that's a major problem uh, that uh, will go on uh, perhaps the next book you do. Um, Linda and Alan value the messiness of democratic debate. They value the provisional nature of the solutions that emerge. They're very comfortable about that and they're very worried about zealots either from the science community or from ideological communities who think they actually know the answer. Uh, they don't talk at all about things like uh, the use of evidence in program evaluation or other kinds of things. In fact, they say on page 66 that they're not going to talk about that at all. Um, uh, that, that's a shame, I think, but um, <laughs> because if, if you're looking for a counter proposition about, well, how could good evidence be used in a productive and useful way that somehow finds uh, a useful balance between uh, expertise and actually knowing what you're talking about and maintaining the trust and legitimacy of the process, the democratic legitimacy that's required, I think that would be uh, another book. Uh, perhaps another topic uh, for another day. So for me, uh, last sentence, uh, for me, uh, evidence-informed policy ideas is what we should be striving for, uh, not, not truth. And uh, we should have a mission in the academy and more broadly to argue for the value of expertise uh, in a respectful way. Thank you.